So tonight we are uh, we are coming out of the book of Daniel, and uh, I'm going to give just a little bit of background tonight. Uh, our our topic is new hotness. New hotness. So this is coming from uh, Daniel chapter three, and. and starting at, well, really, if you, if you kind of start from the beginning of, of uh, chapter two, all the way into chapter three is where we're going to end up right in the middle of chapter three. And so the Israelites are in exile. And while they are there, Daniel, uh, who is the prophet who, who writes, this, uh, writes this text, Daniel is trying to get in the service of the king. He, he's gaining a good reputation for himself. And so the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and this is in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and he's got all of his, uh, I was going to say musicians, he's got all of his magicians and, and, and tellers and all of that who, who try to interpret this dream for him. And they're unable to. Well, Daniel is able to. He talks to God, he's a prophet, and so God gives him the answer. And so he goes to the king, he interprets the dream, and folks are kind of upset about it because, you know, if you have a position, if you got a role, if you got a job and somebody comes in and they, they're not even supposed to be there, like they're supposed to be like temporary help and they come in and they do your job, you're going to be a little bit, you're going to feel some kind of way about it because now you feel like your position is challenged. And that's what happened uh, with these people uh, who worked for King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was super impressed, and as suspected, Daniel got put in, uh, he got appointed to a position uh, and was given some, given some authority. Now, Daniel is the type of dude that we all need in our lives and the type of person that we should try to be for other people. When Daniel got put on, he put his boys on too. So that Shadrach, Meshach, and that bad Negro. Abednego. Now, mind you, those are their Babylonian names. Uh, John was teasing me earlier this week because I called them Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. That's what their mama named them. That's what I'm going to call them. But Daniel made sure to put his boys on too. So they were all appointed to positions because of Daniel's faithfulness to God and faithfulness to God's word, the word that God gave him to interpret the dream. So they're on and these other dudes are kind of hot. Like, why are these temps that we brought in, that we brought in from outside, why are these temps getting put in these positions that we've been, you know, we've been maintaining this and nobody's been able to challenge us. So they come up with a way that they think they can get these guys. So they have Nebuchadnezzar, who is not a worshiper of the true God, build this statue of himself, an idol, and say, hey, how about this, King Neb? We're going to have everybody... We're going to have everybody bow down uh, and, and do some worship. We'll have a worship session, and we're going to have the, the musicians play. And when the musicians, when the band gets going, then we want everybody to start worshiping you. So, I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's like, bet. Go ahead and do it. Like, signs the check or puts a stamp on the coin or whatever they did back then. And so they built this thing and they have this big assembly and the band starts playing and everybody bows down to worship. And because these dudes were setting setting folks up, they all they were already looking out for not all the Jews. If you look at the scripture, it says certain Jews. Certain Jews. Have you ever had somebody like on your job or in some type of situation, a team that you were on, and they weren't messing with everybody. It was just like, it was just certain people. And it might've been you. It, well, that's what was happening to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were certain Jews that they were coming for. So it happens, music plays, they don't bow. They go to the king. King's like, for real, them? Like, no, nah, they cool. He goes, talks to them, and they're like, nah, we're not gonna do it. He's like, no, come on, just do it for the vine. No, we ain't gonna do it. Just do it for the vine. We ain't gonna do it. 
And so they didn't bow down. The Muslims bowed down, and uh, he was he was hot. Now we call it new hotness because it's there's two kind of there's two hotness. There's, there's this new hotness that uh, that the guys who work for Nebuchadnezzar were trying to put up. They're trying to make King Nebuchadnezzar feel like he was the new hotness. And then when these Hebrew boys were faced with this challenge, they got exposed to some new hotness themselves. So again, we're coming from the book of Daniel. This is in chapter three, uh, verses 16 through 18. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, replied to Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. They bold. We do not need to defend ourselves against you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, this new hotness that you present us with, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us. And then verse 18, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Read that again, because this is real. Mm. Just in case our God does not, does not rescue us from this, we want you to know, we're putting you on notice, your majesty. See how they tried to be like nice, nasty. We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. As Keith already said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put in a very tumultuous situation. It was literally life or death literally life or death, but they still had the boldness to look at the king and say, yeah, now, nah, fam, we're not going to bow. Because here's the thing. We know that the God that we serve can get us out of this. That's no problem whatsoever. But even if he doesn't, you see, a lot of us would be willing to make a stand for God if things are guaranteed. We love guarantees. We love Okay, well, God, if I do this, you're going to bless me with this. We love that. Because who doesn't like to get rewarded for the things that they do? That's, that's a part of the human condition. But what if I told you that at some point you're going to have to make a stand regardless of, number one, what the reward is, and number two, what the circumstances look like? That's really my first point for tonight is that at some point you're gonna have to make a stand. Now, while I can tell you that, I can't tell you if that'll be in your family life, on your job, in your friendships, or even in your romantic relationships, but at some point you are going to have to make a stand. Now the question is, what are you going to stand for? Are you going to stand for God? Or are you going to stand for the convenience of the moment? We live in very peculiar times right now where our faith is consistently under attack. And it's for a lot of different reasons. If we're being honest, the church has not done a great job of being a representation of Christ over the years. We have hurt people. We have done things we're not supposed to do. We have misused the authority that God has given us. And so some of the backlash that we have received is well warranted. Some of this stuff is because people don't like order. A lot of people, especially grown people, they don't like to be told what to do. Come on, even, come if, on. It's, even if it's by God. People can't even wear masks when they go outside. You really think that they want to hear that there is a being that's it's higher than you because to most people they're the god of their own lives but there's a being higher than you knows more than you knows everything about you even the things about yourself that you don't know that you don't want anybody else to know about so at some point everybody on this call is going to have to make a stand but in order to make a stand, you have to have faith. You can't do what Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro did if you do not have faith. 
It's just not possible. Because if you come up against these situations without faith, you're going to fold every single time. I'm not telling you what I heard, not telling you what me and Keith just got through talking about. I'm telling you what I know. If you try to make a stand for God without faith, you're going to give way every single time because the pressure is too great. Again, Nebuchadnezzar was big mad that these boys would not bow to an image of himself. While there may not be any fiery furnaces physically today that people are being thrown into, you've got, you've got losing your job, losing your social standing, losing your very reputation if you decide to take a stand for God. But are you willing to do it? Well, that leads me to my second point. Faith ain't faith, not isn't. Faith ain't faith if it's only used in comfortable situations. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to get in somebody's driveway real quick. So, if you or who I'm talking about, just pray to the Lord and say, ouch, or amen, and we won't know that it's you that I'm talking about. But some of us really are sitting out here with Weenie Hut Jr. faith, bro. Some of us are only faithful to God, number one, when things are guaranteed, and number two, when things look good. But if you only have faith when things look good, I would challenge you and tell you that you don't really have faith at all. It's easy to have faith when all of my bills are paid and I know where the money's coming from and, you know, I'm in good health and, you know, my family's doing good. My spouse loves me. You know, everything is good on the up and up. My kids are acting right. It's so easy to have faith in these moments. But what about when things actually get hard? I want to challenge each of us today to understand that faith is not solely for the good times. Yeah, you need faith for the good times, but if you do not allow for the trials of life to temper and strengthen your faith through those bad times, you're going to have a very hard time walking this walk. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. Satan don't even like lukewarm people, bro. Satan don't even like lukewarm sinners. You really think God got time for lukewarm Christians, for Christians that give way every time some type of pressure comes their way? You don't even have to answer that. I know he doesn't. God's looking for people that are willing to be bold for him at all times, not just when they want something, not just when things are looking great, not just after they've gotten a new job, because see, some of us will go to God and will apply faith, you know, we'll be fervent in prayer. Back when churches were open, we would we would serve faithfully in churches. We'd sing the choir, serve on the usher board, as they said when I was a kid, not usher board, usher board. We'd even be willing to do all these things to get close to God for the blessing. And then as soon as we get it, we fall off. Not only that, but as soon as one thing goes wrong in our lives, all of a sudden, it's as if God has never brought us through anything. But look at these three Hebrew boys. They were taken into captivity. They had everything taken away from them, including their names. But when you messed with their God, that was where they drew the line. Where are you going to draw the line? What is going to be the thing that you say, I'm sorry, I'm not compromising my relationship with God for that? Because there are some relationships that we have that will compromise the relationship that we have with God. So I'm challenging each of us, get your faith game up. Because I guarantee you, if you don't have it up after this year, it's going to be very, very difficult, not impossible, but difficult for you to keep it up. Use this time now while we're in the middle of this pandemic. This is the most free time some of us have had and will probably ever have in our lifetimes. What are you doing to build your faith muscle? How are you using this time to draw closer to God or are you just wasting it? My final point is simply, when we stand on faith, we open the door for the miraculous to occur. Now, when I was sharing and going over my points with Keith the other day, he made me laugh a little bit because he said, oh, well, no, somebody's not going to like that. Miracles only happened in the Bible. Miracles have ceased. Miracles have stopped happening today. But I think that the reason why people think that way is because we have a misconception on what a miracle is. You know, too many times we want a miracle to be this super huge, big thing. 
you know, we want God to come down from heaven in fire and make a way. We want God to do a new thing, but we don't even have faith to stand on the things that he's already done. We don't even have faith to recall to our minds the things that God has brought us through before. But I'm challenging you today because I remember times where I had to stand on my faith to keep me from losing my mind, to keep me from wanting to take my very life, struggling and teetering on the edge of life and death. I've had to do it. That for me is a miracle in and of itself. So when we stand on faith, we open the door for the miraculous to occur. And the miraculous might not always be God coming down from heaven, you know, a, a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He may not do it like that, but I guarantee you, if you stand on faith, God will move. Because if he didn't, Jesus wouldn't have counted the woman in the New Testament. He wouldn't have counted her faith as righteousness if it didn't. So faith is what gets God's attention. You can sing till heaven comes down. You can preach with everything that you got. You can even prophesy in God's name and set people free. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. I don't know who it was that wrote Hebrews. Can't tell you that to save my life. I, well, I can tell you who it wasn't. It wasn't Paul for sure, because Paul would have told us. Paul got a very good way of letting us know that he wrote something. But they were spitting when they said that without faith, it is impossible. There is nothing you can do that can please God without faith. Because it is by faith that we are saved. So if it's by faith that we are saved, how are you going to live a life as a believer without faith? Better yet, how are you going to live a life as a believer with Winnie Hutt Jr. faith, with this baby faith, with this small, scary faith? You mean to tell me that you want God, that you say God called you to the nations, but you can't even go and talk to your siblings about something that's been troubling them and God done put them on your heart for the past two months. You mean to tell me God's called you to do all of these great things, but you don't even have faith enough to go and talk to that family member that you've had it out with and you've had odds with for the past 10 or 15 years. I'm not the best person with numbers, but I do know when stuff don't add up. If you got faith, then you need to walk it out and you need to move it. And there's a reason why I'm hampering on this, because y'all, there are people out here dying right now that need us. And they don't need us to be scary. They don't need us to be conforming. They don't need us to be wimps. They need us to stand because somebody needs to know that the God that kept Israel is still in the keeping business today. Are you going to be willing to answer the call by faith? Are you going to be willing to let God stir up that new hotness in you? Because here's the thing. Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro got thrown into the fiery furnace, all right, for sure. Neb was not playing when he did that. And when he said, he said what he said. He threw him in there. The Bible says that the fire was so hot because he cut it up seven times its normal setting. It was so hot that it burned up the men that were in the that were that threw them in there shadrach meshach and abednego they fell down but this is why us standing on faith is so important nebuchadnezzar looked at looked at his boys and he was just like hey we just threw three hebrews up in there right yeah, yeah king that's what we did okay so how come it's four of them up in there and that fourth one looked like he and fourth one looked like he wanted the, he's the son of the gods while faith may not always get us the result that we want, it gets us the result that God is trying to bring about. Nebuchadnezzar did not become a believer that day, even though he said, well, yeah, their God is God of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar went back to acting fool, and they ended up losing his mind. But when he came back to himself, one thing I know he did was that he held the God of Israel. He held my God as God. So, you standing on faith is more important than you realize because, again, this walk isn't solely about us. It's not solely about what we can get. Bro, if this was just about me, I wouldn't be doing this right now. But by faith, I'm doing this because even with all of the technical difficulties, all of y'all didn't exit out of this call. Could have, but you didn't. And so if we move by faith, 
you just don't know what's going to happen. So many of you have told me that some of the little things I do has helped to inspire you in your walk, the talks that we've had, the different types of moments we've been there for one another in. All of that is by faith. Faith is a necessary component to live a life as a believer. I don't have the secret to get you to a fortune, a mansion, bins, none of that. I do know that if you want to live a successful Christian life, you got to have faith and you got to have more than a little bit of it. Yeah, mustard seed is good to start off with. But at some point in our walks, we shouldn't be content with just that same faith. We should be expecting for God to do the miraculous in our lives every single day. We should be expecting for God to bless everybody that we come across and we have a conversation with. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna, we're gonna break out into, into groups. We've been doing this the last couple of weeks and, uh, and it's been fruitful for us. So we're gonna go into smaller groups because it's, you know, it's not as easy for everybody to talk over everybody. And some of us are louder uh, and some people are just gonna sit back in the cut uh, and not try to talk over 20 people. We wanna give everybody the opportunity to share if, if you'd like to. Uh, but before we before we go into those groups, I want to go over the questions that we uh, that we're going to discuss. So the first question is, what is faith to you? What is faith to you? The second question, historically, and the reason I put historically in there because you might decide that after hearing what what John had to say you might decide that this is in the past. Historically, what have you been unwilling to put on the line to take a stand for God? Historically, what have you been unwilling to put on the line to take a stand for God? And then the last question, what is currently standing in the way of you taking the stand or the step you should be taking? What is currently standing in the way of you taking the stand or step you should be taking right now. Into, into some more discussion. I just wanted to, I wanted to share a passage. Uh, Jonathan referenced uh, Hebrews 11, 6 earlier. And I just wanted to read this passage for us um, as we go back into, go back into discussion. So this is Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 1. Uh, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understood that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. Before, for before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Or if you grew up on another translation, uh, he rewards those who diligently seek him. Uh, and verse one and, and some other translations, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The substance, substance is tangible and evidence of things not seen. Uh, I, heard, I heard a preacher say this, and just so you know, like, 85% of the material that you hear preachers uh, use, they heard it from another preacher. 
So I'm just borrowing right. something. <clears throat> I'm borrowing something. Uh, and I will not cite my source because I can't think of his name at the moment. Gospel Biden. <laughs> he said evidence. He talked about uh, <clears throat> fingerprint evidence. So when you, when, when you get fingerprinted or, or when you touch something, when I, when I touch this mouse, what gets left behind are my fingerprints. Well, that happens because of, of the oils in my skin. But not only that, depending on how, how firmly I pressed and how sweaty my hand was when I touched something, there's trace DNA that's also left behind. Now, you can't see on this mouse, you cannot see my fingerprints. But I guarantee you, if I did something and somebody needed to prove that I was here in court, my fingerprints could be lifted off of this mouse and used as evidence that I was holding it. Now, you can't see it, but it's still evidence that, that I had my hand on it. And so faith is the substance of what we hope for and the evidence of things we don't see. It's the, it's the, it's the DNA from the fingerprint of God that, he, that he's got his hand on something. I think that was a very good um, illustration that you used. It definitely blessed me because one of the things that it made me think about was the fact that although you can't see faith, it or the lack thereof, it's going to show somewhere. So can somebody see in your everyday life, how you in your everyday life, how you walk, how you talk, how you move, how you treat people, because it's not just our relationship with God that should show people that we're set apart. It's our faith in God. We are living in some very scary times, I must admit. If you are scared by these times, I want to let you know that that's not a bad thing. However, if you give way to fear, that's when we got to we, we got to come back to the drawing board a little bit. Being scared and having fear are two completely different things. Being scared is, well, you know, this stuff is scary, but it didn't catch God by surprise. As long as nothing catches God by surprise, I think I'm pretty good. If God from eternity past, even up until right now, he's seen everything that's going to happen in existence. He knew the end from the beginning. If God knew that big Rona was going to happen and he, still and he still allowed for it to happen, that only lets me know one thing, that God had a purpose in the midst of all of this. Now, can I tell you what that purpose is on the grand scheme of things? Not really. Tell you a couple of things I've learned. Well, I've had reaffirmed people are not that bright. People are very selfish. We are, we are so focused on us to where it's not even funny. The fact that people can't even put a mask on to protect themselves and somebody else from a respiratory disease lets you know how selfish the heart of man really is. However, Woo! however, as believers, we must maintain our faith because here's the thing. If we serve an all powerful God, or at least we say we do, right? We do believe that God can do all things, but we come into these situations cowering and panicking. What is that going to show the world? How, bro, Jesus literally conquered death. The grave literally blew a 3-1 lead. And Jesus got up with all power in his hands, and now his name sits above every name. That, that includes Donald Trump. That includes coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it. God's name sits above all of it. So, if it. so if his name sits above all of it, then what exactly do I have to fear? Now, faith doesn't mean that you go outside and don't put a mask on. Faith doesn't mean that you don't wash your hands. First of all, that's just nasty. I would hope that y'all were washing your hands before this pandemic got started. That, uh, a pandemic shouldn't have to occur for you to take your hygiene seriously. We grown. But just in case it did, I'm not going to roast you in front of everybody. Save that for a private session. Our faith has to stand firm. If, um, if we've ever seen a fiery furnace situation in our lifetime, it's this one right here, because we got a pandemic and pretty much a revolution happening at the same time. You better make sure that your faith is rooted in something outside of you, because if it's rooted in you, I can promise you one thing, you're going to give way. 
And it's not because I don't think the best of you. Man, I think you're great. I think you're talented. I think that you're amazing. I think that God has called you to do amazing things in your lifetime. But you alone ain't enough because if you alone were enough, you wouldn't have needed a savior in the first place.